night. Tremendous. Praise God for our yeah. praise and worship crew. And you're seeing the skeleton crew. Man, when you see, I don't know how many they have, what, 50 or so that are in the choir and stuff, and man, it's, it's just exciting. So we have it almost 100 now, Andrew. Huh? We have almost 100 students in the choir now. Oh, really? Yeah. I knew it was a bunch. And you know, uh, we have open praise and worship on Monday and Wednesday. We invite the community in, and it's also live streamed. Is this live stream to everybody or just our schools? Does anybody know? For tonight? No, I, I was mean, talking about on Monday and Wednesday. Yeah, it's live streamed for everybody. It's for yeah. everybody. Yeah. So uh, you need to check in at 8 o'clock on Monday and Wednesday because I tell you, we have some wonderful, wonderful times. It's just, it's awesome what God's doing. You know, I was thinking tonight about when Jamie and I first got started in ministry and, uh, you know, we didn't have the same confidence level that we have now in a, a lot of things. But there, a lot of, one of the things that has really changed is just to see all of the people that God has brought to us. And, you know, I could go through and literally spend hours talking about the connections and stuff, just like Daniel and the way that he brought, God brought, us, brought him to us and the, and the people that run this conference and all of the people out there parking the cars. I mean, there's no telling. There's hundreds of people working to make this a great experience for you. And I don't even know what all they're doing. <laughs> and it is so satisfying because in the beginning, if Jamie and I didn't do it, it didn't get done. And now we've got all of these people that God has brought. You know, this is one of the things that makes it so awesome. And there are things happening that, you know, I have the general idea of what's happening, but the details, I don't know how it's happening. It's just God and he's brought people and they are doing an excellent job. And I was also thinking about, you know, that you are partners. Uh, this is the way it is. Jamie and I, back in the beginning, man, it was just us. And it's so humbling to see the way that God has brought people to us and the way that you've connected with us, and we just don't feel alone. Man, that's awesome. This has been really a blessing for me. I've enjoyed it. I feel like there has been a supernatural connection made, and even though I didn't get to visit and talk to every single person, I believe that in the spirit, you know, there is a connection made and it just really encourages me and I pray that you got the same thing and that you feel connected more with the ministry and that you're a vital part of it and, and we want you to be blessed because you are a blessing and you are touching lives all over the world. We want to show a little three, what we call the 3D flyover and this is the one that Jimmy Davidson, the guy who used to do animation for Disney, he came and helped us with this. And this is kind of a vision. I've sat down with some people. And, you know, the, one of the things that we really need is student housing here. And there were some things that happened just tonight. I certainly can't tell you about it because it's very premature. But, man, things are happening quickly. I think it's going to be a blessing. And um, anyway, when I started considering student housing, I didn't want to take this pristine property that God has given us and just build a unit, you know, that would house 300 people in something like a dormitory and change the whole look and the feel of it. And so I've sat down with some people and I drew uh, actually on a, a piece of paper what I wanted and then somebody took it and made it look nice. And, uh, and anyway, we've come up with an idea of scattering housing in lodges where one lodge will house 30 uh, singles in a dormitory and they'll be hidden back here in the woods so that you won't even be able to see them when you drive in the property it'll be a separate area over here and then over here we've got it designed to put in some fourplexes that will house families and um, anyway so we have just produced a little video and let me say that before we even get started on this that 
when Jesse was talking, you know, my uh, estimate, and this is just a very rough estimate, is about $180 million to build these lodges, the fourplexes, and a student activity center where all of these people who live here on the property can congregate and eat, you know, and get their meals. And then when we have a conference like this, we'll be able to feed everybody in this 600 uh, seat uh, restaurant and things like this. And so my immediate vision is 180 million, and it could be 200 million. I, I said that for Jesse's benefit today. But beyond that, I've got a vision, and this is way premature, but I really believe that someday that we will get this adjacent 450 acres that's over here. And um, we used to have 350 employees down in the Springs. Now, some of them have moved up here since we're occupying 25% of this building, so I'm not sure exactly how many are left, but at least 250 or 300 student, uh, staff are still down in Colorado Springs. We'd be able to bring them up here and put them in that building that's over there. And then I see building a sports complex, and a theatrical thing where the, you know, the floor, you can rise up in the floor, sink down into the floor and have things fly and do all of this so that we are going to have a first class uh, theater so that our performing arts can do their thing. And so anyway, who knows how much that's going to cost. But as Jesse says, God didn't ask me to pay for it. He just told me to believe for it. So that's what I'm believing for. So anyway, this is the very first step. I'd like to play this little 3D flyover and I'll kind of narrate some of this so that you can see what, what we're doing. All right, so this is coming from that direction over there across this pond that we have, looking at the current building that we have. And this is the building that we're in right now that I call the barn. And uh, that's our first building. The second building, you can see it taking shape and it is going to be twice the size of the building that we're in right here. And that's, I guess I'm going to call it the auditorium. I'm very creative on my name. And that's going to be 152,000 square feet. And then adjacent to it is the parking garage. And it's going to be 336,000 square feet, five stories, two stories below ground. And it'll park 1,085 cars, which we really need that, as most of you have found out. Amen. And so over here on the right is this student activities center. We'll come back to that. But there will be a walkway connecting it so that we can use that parking garage also for the student activity center. And then back over the hill here, back into the woods, is where we have 11 dormitories planned. Each dormitory will house, I think it's either 30 or 33 students or something like that. But there will be 11, 30 students each and 11 lodges, and they'll be basically hidden back into the woods. It's gonna be an awesome place for the students, and uh, it's gonna be very nice. Inside, it's gonna be like this with beams and a two-story uh, ceiling in the center, a place that they can congregate and do things, and it's gonna be very, very nice. So these are the lodges that we are planning here. And we have two different designs. One is kind of a square and the other one's an oblong design so that they won't be exactly the same, but it's gonna be really nice. I think the students will enjoy it. And you know, part of the experience here is not just the word, and of course that's the most important thing, the presence of the Holy Spirit and all of that, but man, the surroundings are just, I mean, this is a God deal and I figured I'm gonna capitalize on it and make it so that it'll be an awesome place to live. So down here at the pond, we've got a 450 seat amphitheater that we are gonna put in and eventually we're gonna have water shooting up and uh, laser shows on it and we're gonna open that to the public during the summer and stuff. And this is gonna be a tourist destination that we can minister to people through that. You see where our parking is now, that's over a fourth of a mile from our facility. And then here are these fourplex cabins down in here and there will be nine of them and uh, there's four, I don't know what you call them, four um, apartments in each one of those. So that'll be 36 families will be able to stay in there. This is, this is gonna be awesome. So again, it may not be exactly like this, but this is the idea that we have at the moment. If we get, when we get the 400, 
50 acres over here, we might spread this out some and put some over there. But anyway, this is our concept at the moment. And so then it'll come back up to the building that we're in now and the one that we're working on. And this is the road that you drive up to get in here. And over on the right hand side, this building that we passed up before, this is going to be our student activity center. And again, we haven't got far enough to tell you exactly how many square feet it's going to be, but it's going to be huge. It'll have a 600 square foot, I mean a 600 seat uh, restaurant in it. And then it'll have, um, you know, coffee shop and areas for the students to get together and watch uh, the Super Bowl and all kinds of stuff. And it's just going to be an activity center for them. And uh, for my British people, they put in a soccer field. So I don't know if we'll have the soccer field or not. But anyway, this is a little idea of what our facility is going to look like. And I really believe that this is going to be the premier Bible college. I think it already is, really, as far as the content and stuff. But it's going to draw people from all over the world. Does anybody know right now, I think we have 60 or 70 different nations represented here on this local campus. Does anybody know for sure? Anyway, 60 or 70. And uh, we also have a VA approval. And I forget how many... Um, military people are coming on the VA bill, but I, I'd imagine it's well over 50 years. Does anybody know? So that's a blessing. And I tell you, it's just the sky's the limit. And I really believe that if the Lord tarries, that our Bible college, of course, is going to live way beyond me and it will be impacting people. And we've had some prophecies, and I, it's already happening. I've been in other countries where I've seen our Bible college students meet with the president and the first lady of other countries, and I mean them just supernaturally have favor, and, and they just said, you know what, we will do anything you need, whatever you want, you just ask us. And I mean, we have uh, in Uganda alone around half a million people that go through our discipleship evangelism program on a weekly basis. We are evangelizing an area in Karamoja that just five years ago, or six, maybe six or seven now, but they were cannibals. And we actually had a girl that came and her friend was killed and eaten in front of her eyes. Five or seven years ago, something like that. And then they tried to eat her and they started by cutting off the flesh under the arm and it tasted so bad that they spit it out. They cut off the flesh under the other arm and they just said she didn't taste good. And they cut off a leg and threw her in a ditch to die. And she survived it. And that's only been just a few years ago. And now we are in that very area evangelizing those people. I went there a few years back and I just, I tried to minister to the people but they, they, this was a village called Lodoy, which Lodoy means rat in that language. And, and when I went in, they were cooking rats. That's, that was the best thing they had to eat. And most of the time they didn't have even rats. And they were living the way that they lived a thousand years ago. They had never seen a cell phone. They had never seen an a iPad. They had never seen a camera. We had our cameras with us. We've actually got footage of this. And uh, these people were just so primitive and they asked me to preach to them. And the whole village turned out, there was hundreds. And I started preaching, but how do you preach to people that if you tell them about Jesus, they've never heard of Jesus. They didn't understand what being crucified was. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand the Jews. They didn't understand the Romans. They had no reference. They didn't know anything outside of their village. Many of them weren't even wearing clothes. And I was just at a loss and I preached the best I knew how and we had nearly the whole group raise their hand and want to get saved. And that was great. And then they started having me, cut. I laid hands on every child in that village, but boy, I was so convicted because God has put on my heart to not just evangelize, but to disciple people. And I knew that what I shared with them was so small compared to what they needed to know that the people that were with me I said you've got to help me this is not 
true evangelism here. I said, we got to do something more than this. And it just so happened that the man, Pastor Francis, I had been in his village on the opposite side of Uganda. He was probably 15 hour drive from where we were. And I said, you've got to help me. We've got to do something. And he had been teaching my discipleship evangelism course. And he was the one that got these 500,000 people in Uganda to going through the course. And I said, Francis, you got to help me do something. And he says, you know, I just resigned my church two months ago. And God told me that I had to start traveling and taking discipleship evangelism all over Uganda. And he says, if you want me to, I'll come here and we will start evangelizing those people. And since that time, we've now got one of our Bible college graduates, Ricky Burge, which this is another one of these divine connections. Ricky Burge was a drug dealer and he was shot and left for dead over a bad drug deal and he woke up in the morning and he was still alive and he just got born again and I mean within a couple of months of that experience came here to Caris Bible College and this guy is fired up, turned on. He's now been in Uganda for us. He runs most of the things that we do in Uganda and this guy has a love for the Ugandan people and he is over there directing it and he has taken us to a totally different level. We've now drilled, or we are in the process of drilling 11 water wells. And one of the things that we did, instead of going in and doing the humanitarian things first, which that's the way that it's usually done and that's the inroad that people use, we went in and just started preaching the gospel to these people. And we did that for a couple of years without giving them any of the humanitarian things. And the reason was we wanted them to commit to the Lord because of their commitment to Him and not just the fact that we were buying their acceptance. And now that they, we have, um, I couldn't tell you, but it's, it's d at least dozens, I think over a hundred sinners over there. We, uh, anyway, I could spend the whole night telling you about that. But God gave us divine connections and we have hundreds of sinners and people are evangelizing. I went over there and we had to fly in and land in pastures. We had to actually delay our flight because all of the villagers were out with machetes clearing a place for the plane to land. And we landed in the field and I've been over there and this one lady, Esther, she couldn't read or write. She, you know, it's hard to tell age over there. I'm not familiar with that, but she was at least 50. She might have been 60, and she was walking 22 kilometers, which would be, what is that? Somewhere around 12, 13 miles, one way to come to our discipleship evangelism courses. She got turned on, fired up, went back, and in one month time taught herself how to read. She had never read. And she's now reading the, gospel, the Bible and she has started three or four churches and has seen hundreds and hundreds of people born again. And it's just awesome what she's doing. And that's just one person. And so anyway, now that we have these hundreds of groups over there, we are drilling water wells. We, you, you might have seen, probably not, but if you were to drive up to our lodge here, we're actually digging a trench now to put in water to one of these cabins that was... Uh, here it's a historical marker. They wouldn't let us tear them down. So we are putting an aquaponics thing in there. And the purpose is to raise fish, use their waste to recycle and grow food. And we're teaching these people that have never had anything how to do this. And we're doing a pilot program right here. And one of our partners paid for that whole thing. And then we're going to export this to Uganda. And we're drilling water wells for them. Uh, we were over there and we saw these babies with swollen bellies that are dying because the water's uh, killing them. We've got actual pictures. I wished I had this footage, but we've got pictures of them drinking out of this hole that they dug uh, to trap rainwater. And it's just filthy. <clears throat> and the cows and the goats are standing in it and urinating in it. And that's where they get their water. And people are dying because of this. I went over and prayed for one of the pastors wives who was dying from this kind of stuff and praise God, God raised her up and she lived through it. But we could stop a lot of this by just providing clean water and we're also going to start raising pigs because the Muslims are trying to infiltrate this area and, the pi and Muslims hate pigs so much 
that we're going to start raising pigs and the Muslims won't come anywhere close to them. Amen. So there's things like this happening. We've got a school in South Africa that you have helped us to equip and there are 40 something kids. I've been over there twice now and I mean it is out in the middle of nowhere and this town was just, there's probably only a hundred people in the town and there was, it was so bad that the police left. And it was just totally wild. The children were running the streets and this one lady, Mandy, started taking children into her home and started teaching them. And I mean, just doing it out of her own pocket, feeding them because most of them didn't eat. And anyway, we built a school for them, put in uh, uh, mobile homes and stuff, but it was on community property where the police vacated. Well, now the city is so totally changed that the police have come back and they've taken back their place and they're about to close the school down. So I'm in the process of building them a school on their own property and we're doing things like this all over the world and we could go on and on and on talking about it. But all of you are involved in all of these things. And I tell you, we, we actually have a larger impact other places in the world than we do in the United States. We are seeing miracles happen. And I could give you testimony. We have dozens of people that have been raised from the dead by our students all over the world. And it is just fantastic. When we go to Uganda, it's like we're celebrity. Man, everybody there knows me. There are more people that watch me in Uganda per, per, per capita than there is any place in the world. We're on twice a day on a station that covers the whole nation. And it is just amazing. So anyway, I just am sharing those things to share with you that you're a part of all of that. And I wished we had time to give you all of the things going on, but just don't have time. Paul, would you come up here? And I'd like to quickly ask Paul if he would to share a little bit about some of the reorganization that's taken place because we were sharing with some of our partners here just a while ago and the whole ministry has transformed. We were in good shape, God had blessed us, but since Paul has come in and Paul is connected with uh, Dr. Dean Radke, Billy Epperhart and others, he has taken our ministry to a whole new level and one of the things we've done is reorganize which is going to give us freedom to do things that we have never done in the past. So share just a little bit. He, he knows more about this than I do. Well, what we um, actually starting about two years ago, I took over about uh, in April, on April the 1st, 2014. And I spent the first 90 days just analyzing the ministry. I've been on the board of directors for years, but, you know, it's not close enough to see really what's going on. So as we, as we began to analyze it, I told Andrew, I said, we got some really serious risks for the ministry. One of those was that the only, or, the only legal organization was the 501c3 that was Andrew Womack Ministries. So Karis Bible College was, all, was lumped into Andrew Womack Ministries as a 501c3. And many of you know that's a nonprofit organization. It's an IRS designation. And so I, Billy, I've known Billy Epphart for 30 years. I wish Billy was here. He's, he's just an unbelievable blessing to this ministry. He's been a blessing to Patsy and I for decades. Billy's a, probably the foremost expert in real estate investment. He's a multimillionaire. I've done real estate deals with him. You, you just don't lose any money with Billy. He's just a brilliant, but he, his real genius is organizational structure. So I called Billy in and I said, we, I want to present Andrew with a new structure that really sets this ministry up for where I think it's going to go. When I first took over, you know, I, I would tell Andrew, I said, you know, <clears throat> I, this ministry is going to be a hundred million dollar ministry. That first year I was here is a little over 30, probably 34 million. And so I could see if we went to a hundred million, we really had to restructure. So the first thing that our exposure was, you business people that know anything about a balance sheet, here's what we're doing. As you see us building these buildings, how many of you know we built them for cash? Well, I could take that balance sheet with that cash to any bank in town. They would beg me to take their money, wouldn't they, Joe? They'd be they'd beat my door down. And here's what we did. We, we transferred that cash and turned it into buildings. So it just moved across the balance sheet from cash to assets. So as that happened, I, 
I looked here, we've got one 501c3 structure that's going to put our assets at great risk because how many of you know there's people that don't love us? Thank God you love us, but there's folks out there that don't love us and don't love Andrew and don't, don't like what he's doing and the devil really don't like what he's doing. So I just began to mitigate the risks that were associated with the ministry. So Billy and I came up and Curtis, Fisk, Curtis, he's not here tonight, is he? Curtis, he, he was such instrumental in this. We worked hours and hours to def, de, basically design this new structure. So here's what we've done. Um, all these assets that you see here, see right now the balance sheet's at $65 million in assets. That's a lot of assets. We are, let me tell you something, we are equity rich. <laughs> I, it, it's just incredible. Can you imagine billing all this for cash? If I could tell you the story and how faithful God has been month after month after month, it would astound you what God has done. But so what we did was we, the first thing we did was we got in a room and we, and we basically modeled all this out. So to protect these buildings from lawsuit, what you have to do is you have to create what's known as a 5012C. Let me just say this, that the reason we needed to protect it is not because we we're going to do something to hurt people. But our declaration of dependence, they are convinced that there's people that will hate us so much for taking this stand and becoming more political that they're going to come ask after us. And this is one of the things they do is go after the assets. Yeah, and, and, and you know what, that may not, thank God if it doesn't happen. I mean, I don't want it to happen, you understand? <laughs> but uh, the, de the declaration of dependence, and, and listen, this is what's interesting. Karen Conrad down here sent me, the, we, we, did, we went to the LA Times and the New York Times last weekend, and I got the first response out of that in, as an email. And Karen sent me an email and said, look at this. The most negative response we received to the de Declaration of Dependence was from a Christian writer with, with, Christian, with uh, Christian World Today. It's a New York Times affiliate is what it is. So they're, you know, they call themselves, he, they say they're Christian writers, but they probably wouldn't qualify for me and you. Can, they, can we just <laughs> say that? But, but here, you know, and I read that and I'm going, dear, the guys, that he's accusing Andrew of being desperate to try to affect the election. Well, I'm glad he thinks that, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> <clears throat> He's talking about how desperate Christians are getting, you know, anybody that would, that would basically try to lump or elect Donald Trump's got a problem. So anyway, that's what's going on. But, it, but you know what? We weren't, believing for the, we weren't believing for somebody to sue us for the assets, but that could happen. And you mitigate those risks in the corporate world through, through organizational structure. So what we did was we created a 5012C and we transferred all the assets, the deeds to this property and all these buildings. I just signed the deeds this last week and we transferred those into the 5012C. Now they're protected. So here's, here's, here's what happens. All of our activities go through Andrew Womack Ministries or Karis Bible College. So if you're going to sue us, you got to sue us where the activities are. There's no assets. I mean, you can come after our cash flow, but let me tell you something. I, I've been in the corporate world for a long time. A lawyer would look at that and say, I'm not messing with it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend my time with it. If, they can't, if a lawyer can't pull a bunch of money out of it, he's not going to mess with it. So that's what we did. So we've, now we've, got, we've got, still got Andrew Womack Ministries. Now, and I, I don't want to get this too complicated. I just want you to see the overall. But the top level structure now is what's known as an association of convention and churches. That name doesn't really tell you much because all that means is that we've got a top line organization that's a 501c3 that's called an association of convention and churches, which allows us to build all these other organizations underneath it and still have control. See, we don't want Andrew and Jamie to ever lose control of their own ministry. You know that's happened before? We got a, Andrew's got a friend right here in town, Dr. James Dobson. That's exactly what happened to him. They fired him from his own ministry, took it away from him. <clears throat> and so as we built this structure, I would tell Andrew, I'm going to lock this up so tight, hey, can't anybody get close to you and Jamie. <clears throat> so... We just had a meeting, what, two days ago. To, we, were going to, we were going to give all this language to Andrew and Jamie to show them how tight we'd made this thing. we still got to make some changes to it. But we've been working with our lawyers out of Tulsa, probably one of the best Christian law firms in the country, winners. And these guys are Kenneth Copeland's and Joyce Myers, and you guys that have been in the ministry for a while know who they are. Wes Carter is our guy that did all that helped us do all this. And anyway, what, what we did was we, um, we've tightened up the language so much in the new documents that will, the bylaws that will govern these new structures that there's, there's pot, we, we plugged up every hole. And let me just tell you something, in the legalese, there's lots of holes. 
And we plugged up every hole so that Andrew and Jamie never lose control of what's going on here. So now we have the convention, Association Convention of Churches. It, it's, it, think of it this way. It's a big umbrella. And it basically hovers over all the other organizations I'm about to tell you about. And it basically is where, basically, here's the way it works. Uh, Andrew and Jamie reside in that corporation, and I'll reside in that corporation. And so what that allows us to do is we can control all these other entities through that association. So now you've got that. You've got the 5012C, which is a holding company. It's called an asset holding company. So all of our assets go into that holding company. And, and, all, and, that, and here's the way, there's a, there's a lot of layers to this. And again, I don't want to make this too complicated, but the stock of that 5012C it has the ability to own other corporations so that the activities in those corporations, you go after them, you still can't get to the assets in the 5012C. So here's what we did. We, we formed a C-Corp. How many of you know what a C-Corp is? That is the, that is the run of the mill. That's Apple Computer, General Motors. That's the ones that you, you, know, you get double taxed on. Okay, if you're going to start a company, you probably need to start an S-Corp, not a C-Corp. But C-Corps, it, it, we, we established that for a reason. Because now the IRS allows something. I'm going to make this too complicated, Andrew. The IRS allows something that's, that's called <laughs> passive income. Do I? I said it's getting too complicated for me. I'll, 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 My eyes are beginning to glaze. I'll zip it up. <laughs> but... Uh, they allow, we, can, we can actually allow passive income that can go to the 5012C, then go to Andrew Womack Ministries and we'll have to pay taxes on it. But in that C Corp, let me give you, the, the, let me just major on this for just a second. In that C Corp, what that allows us to do then is, is to develop and, and form for profit entities. In 1999, I, I was at a, doing a conference and the Lord gave me a prophecy and I prophesied that in the coming century, the tithes and offerings would no longer support the vision. And the churches and ministries would have to start for-profit companies to meet the vision that God was giving his men like Andrew Womack. And that's exactly what we're doing. So you say, well, how, what, what kind of companies? I'll give you one example. There's many, but I'll give you one. One of the things we had to do when we rebuilt the infrastructure here at Andrew Womack when I took over, the backbone of this ministry, which is a donorware software, it's, that, it's how you run all your donor programs, how we take care of you as partners. I mean, there's so many things we have to do through that donorware program. They, I asked them to come give me a demonstration like the third week I took over. I'm, here's what I'm looking at, guys, a 32-year-old software program. I'm, I'm looking at a DOS screen. I said, God help us. Let me tell you what happened. I, I immediately went to Andrew and said, Andrew, we're going to have to spend $600,000 just to get the backbone software of this place back where it needs to be. We, implement, we implemented that, got it on the road. Let me, tell, let me tell you what happened to us. Within, I guess it was three or four months of the time we started that implementation work, Donor called us and said, you got 45 days, we're out of business. Now, here's what that means. You say, well, that's no big deal. You just, well, you just don't change back. <laughs> you just don't change those things overnight. We were, we were actually trying to design manual programs so, it, so that in the Comm Services Center we could take orders, pray for people, do partnerships, all the stuff we do by computer, now we're going to do it by hand. So that's what so we, we, we did. A, I, I would bore you telling you all the things we did to rebuild the infrastructure of the ministry. So then that for-profit corporation, our first, our first entity is going to be a computer software company. Now, Two years ago, three, yeah, two years ago, I had a uh, student graduate from the business college. His name is John Leong. John here? He's not here, is he? John was the CIO, Chief Information Officer for Asia Pacific. The guy's got a couple things on the ball. He was Deloitte Tush's, um, for all of Australia, he was president of Deloitte Tush. He shows up at the business school. Second week, I got handed his resume. I walked over to John and said, what are you doing in my business school? He said, I know how the world does it. I want to know how God does it. I said, that's the man I got to have. He graduates. I hire him as CIO of this ministry within a month of the time he graduates. So here, here's what John, John eats and sleeps corporate. I mean, he understands it. All you got to do is just point him in the right direction. So he's in the process right now. We're doing a complete model business plan for a computer software company that will go into the C-Corp. Here's, here's why. Because we're building all this software in-house now. And so ministries like Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Meyer and all these great nonprofits out there, they're going to be buying their software from us. 
So and, our, we, our, and we paid 600000 for the software, and then how much do we pay on a monthly basis? Oh, about 21000 or so. And so anyway, instead of all of that money going to somebody else, we're going to be charging this, maybe at a little discount for the other ministries, but it'll all be yeah, coming to us. We'll, we'll be bless making them. millions of it. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, here, here's what's interesting. It, um, the new software we have is called Donor Direct. Uh, Joyce Meyer uses it, Kenneth Copeland uses it, it's the state of the art. We may not even have it three or four years because what I told John Leong to do, I said, get your best, but we, we have a genius. I'm talking about people, guys, people, God sending you people. I had a graduate out of the business college. His name is Adam. And Adam, is, uh, he was, he was wo horribly wounded in, in Iraq. He had traumatic brain injury. All, and he goes to Andrews GTS in Manhattan at Queens College. Well, I think he had at Queens College. He gets miraculously healed. He's here. He came to the Bible College. He graduated my third year business school. Another genius like John Leong. So I just. And that Adam, him. that Adam also has, I believe, a doctorate degree from MIT. He, listen, he was he was accepted for the doctorate chemistry, PhD in chemistry from MIT. This is the kind of people God sent in Andrew. So I, I roped him, and so we, anyway, we've, we've resourced the IT department, which was horribly under-resourced when I came. So here's what they're doing right now. They're taking apart Donor Direct because it's the state of the art and everybody loves it. We're just going to find out what makes it tick. We're going to build our own. So we'll build our own Donor Direct software. I, we have a list of 12 other programs that are used in inventory management, all other kinds, accounting, all other kind of things in ministry and far, this is all going to be designed for nonprofit corporations. I'll make John the president of that corporation. We'll, we'll eventually resource it and we'll sell those. We'll go out and have salespeople who will market those to the nonprofit world. How's that? That's number one. Okay. So, uh, you know, I love ministry and I'm, I'm learning how to run a big ministry, but I can run a company. I know business. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to build, and, and I don't know, you know, in 10 years, we may have 25 or 30 major operating corporations that are feeding in. See, there won't be any fat cat like me pulling off all the profit. It's all going to go to the ministry. And we're going to create wealth. We're talking about this. Why don't we just go do it? We're going to create wealth. For the, and and I did, Andrew's an idea a minute anyway. I mean, you got dear Lord, the guy's he never, vision never stops. And so we've, I've got a list of ideas in my desk. And as we get time, we'll vet those business ideas one at a time and we'll build them into that C Corp. So now let me, let me finish quickly if I can. So the, the Association of Convention of Churches is a 501c3. Come over here if I could draw it out for you. Right over here is the 5012c, all of our assets going to that holding company. Right down here is the C Corp. The 5012c owns all the stock of the C Corp. Guess what that means? It's protection. It's, it, it's risk mitigation for the, for the C Corp. Next thing is, come back over here. I can draw a box right here. CBC will now be its own 501c3. Its, its major assets, which are these buildings, are, are protected and hiding over there in the 5012c. So um, Karis Bible College will be separate from Andrew Womack Ministries, which, which also uh, mitigates risk. Then is Robert, Rossi, Robert, Elizabeth, did, did she take care of the kids tonight so you could come? Praise God. <laughs> Robert, stand up and say hello to people. We, yeah, this is right. Robert Mirren. <laughs> so I got to tell this quick story. So when we met them, Andrew, we met them together in London. No, in uh, Walsall. We were in Walsall. <clears throat> and so I'm standing out in the, in the foyer where we sell all of our product, just looking at and making sure things are going right. This is our Grace and Faith Conference. We have 4,000 people show up at this thing. And so I'm standing out there, and Elizabeth starts walking toward me. Here's a statue s woman come walking toward me, and she didn't look happy. I don't know what, and she walks over to me, and she says, you're Paul Milligan. She points her finger at me. I said, who are you? And she said, you ruined my life. I'm thinking, man, I didn't, I don't remember doing this. <laughs> so she said, I, she said, you, you and Andrew have changed our life. I said, what happened? She said, my husband got a hold of your finance, teaching on finances, and he's making me do it, and it's ruined my life. I can't, I can't waste money anymore. I can't do it. <laughs> so they showed up, and God had blessed them. They're out of debt. I got, got in good financial condition, and that's where they met Andrew. That's how, that's how this all got hooked up. So anyway, uh, Robert and Elizabeth, to do all these 
these programs. How many of you enjoyed that, what Jamie and them did with that? Was that good? Um, listen, I've heard, and it's still, I still want to cry. I mean, Andrew, he, he, he got the last one we did live here in, in, in the auditorium. He's, he calls me a big crybaby. Because here, Dean Radke and I are sitting over here at a table, and our wives and Todd, and, and they're doing this, and I'm, we're bawling like a bunch of babies. I mean, it's just powerful, guys. You've got to see this. Get the DVD and bless people at Christmas with a DVD. I'm telling you, it'll bless their lives. Anyway, so what we did was uh, we're, we're doing joint venture with Robert and Elizabeth. And I'm not going to go through because it it's complicated because they have a company in Norway. And we had to build a corporation as an interim in the United States to hook their corporation to us. So I don't want to get into all that. But it, it just suffice it to say then we're going to be able to do all these projects and programs. They're going to make money. And that money, will, and, and Robert and Elizabeth are just so gracious about all this, and you know they they own it. I mean, the copyrights, they're the they're the brains and the genius behind all this, and they're just sharing it with us, sharing the financial blessing. This is what it's supposed to be, and so we're forming that corporate. Do we have a name for that? It's the Highlights Media, Highlights Media. That's going to be called Highlights Media. So that's another corporation that we'll set up there, and then there's there's another corporation that we're going to set up that it will basically be a holding company that, so that we can do any activities Andrew and Jamie want to do that don't fit anywhere else. And, and, we, and that holding, that little corporation will be sort of a, a dumping ground. So if we want to do something like, um, let me show you what, how, how that would work. If Andrew wants to do something again like declaration of dependence that might put the ministry at risk, we'll just go do it over there. And that way legally they got to come to that corporation to do it. So that, there are five new structures, six counting the one we're doing with the Murin. So what was one 501c3 called Andrew Walmart Ministries, now you're going to have to think of us as five or six corporations doing what God's called Andrew and Jamie to do. Amen? You're helping us do it. Thanks, Paul. So I thought it would bless you as partners just to see that, you know, that God sent us some real quality people. Things are being done with excellence. And, man, we are set up to just grow and grow and grow. And I think he said that we were at 34 million or something when he took over two years ago. And then this last year, kind of worldwide, we were at 56, is that right? That's the way that it's grown. And uh, we're believing that we will be at 100 million within a year or so. And that's what I need in order to be able to do things. So again, you're a part of this and we just wanted to say thanks. So tonight I want to play another little selection. And Nate, stand up over here. This is Nate Carter. And Nate is the guy that you saw last night in the hem of his garment singing. He was the lame man who could walk. And Nate plays Haman, uh, or I always called it Haman, but I'm learning from Robert and Elizabeth. It's Haman, and he plays this. And this is kind of, it's not a comedy, but it's one of the lighter scenes in God is with us. And I thought you'd really be blessed by this, so... I want you to watch uh, Nate playing Haman here, and we'll play this. Presents to you Esther, the coming queen of Persia. <laughs> and isn't she lovely? Now the king loved Esther more than all the others, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight. But Esther was unaware of the danger within the walls of the palace. The king's servant, Haman. <laughs> This fortune, fame, and power. Yet the king so wise has given it to me. I am Persia's number one man of the hour. It is written in his majesty's decree. I am honest, wise, and just, and oh, so humble. Well, I must admit, the mirror 
purpose of life. So to recognize the gift that is among them, everyone must bow when I come passing by. This ring I wear upon my finger, the king has placed upon my hand, for he delights to bring me honor in the city of Shishan. But there is something fishy brewing in our kingdom. A gefilte smell I just can't tolerate. I suspect the odors coming from those Hebrews. I'm the one who's always praying at the gate. These wretched strangers dwell among us and spread like cancer through our land. With a skillful knife, I'll cut them out in the vicinity of Shishan. that your people should not obey the laws of this land. Yet you, Mordecai, refuse to obey the king's command and bow down to me. So listen here, you dirty Jew. I've had just about enough of you. The gods forbid. If I were you, I'd do just what I was told to do. Now hit the ground and kiss my shoe. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, he was filled with wrath and sought to destroy all the Jews who were in the kingdom. Because Haman had deceived the king, Ahasuerus allowed him to issue a decree all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, should be killed. When Mordecai learned of all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. So anyway, that's awesome. I'd like to also invite you that uh, at Easter, does anybody have the dates of our God with us this year? April what? April 7th and 8th. I think that's a Friday and Saturday and there's a matinee on Saturday. So three performances. We would love to have you come. It is awesome. Also at Christmas, our media, our, let's see, the creative arts department here at Karis Bible College is putting on what we call the heart of Christmas, and it's actually the story of the fourth wise man, but it's in a modern day setting, and they're reading a book about the fourth wise man and flashing back, so it's got the modern day carols and things in it, along with the story of Jesus and the fourth wise man who came to worship, and I tell you, it is awesome. So that will be happening what, the first or second week of December? It's 11th and 12th. The 11th and 12th of December. And I tell you, these are first-class productions. They take this whole area over here on both sides and put in stage, and it's got a rotating thing so that it's got, I think one of them has at least two or three different scenes, and they rotate them. And so it is amazing what they do. It is worth coming to see. We've had people who were... Uh, uh, had gone to Broadway performances and said that they thought that these things are every bit as good as what they see on Broadway. And so anyway, you're welcome to come. It would be a real blessing to you. Amen? Amen. All right, so tonight, in the time that I have left, you got to watch asking Paul to come up here. <laughs> you preached for an hour and a half this morning or this afternoon, but anyway, I loved it. I know that it blessed you to see what God's doing. God has just sent us these people that are awesome. But in the time left, I want to share with you from 2 Kings chapter 4. And I want to relate some of the things that the Lord has been speaking to me. And these things, you know, this isn't a message that I got for you. This is something that God has been speaking to me. 
And it, I could go back and show you. I called my executive team together and I sat down and I shared, here's what God's been speaking to me. And we are implementing these things here in our ministry. So this is not something that was directly for you. These were things God is speaking to me. But I'm just now sending out a letter. We're going to send it out to 284,000 people that are on our mailing list because it is producing such big time in me that I am determined that this same thing that works for me will work for you. And so we're sending this out to our whole mailing list and going to be sharing uh, these things. And so uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 is the story about the widow woman whose husband had died. Let me just read this. It's verses 1 through 7. And it says in verse 1, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha. Without going into a long explanation, Elisha and Elijah had a school of the prophets. And we know that there were at least 150 because there were three different times that 50 people came out in 2 Kings chapter 2 uh, from three different places. And so that's 150 people. They had hundreds of students that were in the school of the prophets and this was one of their students. And so Elisha had a connection with this man. And it says, uh, the wife came unto Elisha saying, thy servant, my husband is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And so in other words, there was a personal relationship here. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. In those days, if you couldn't pay your debts, they could actually take you and make you a slave or take your children. And so uh, the, the creditor was going to take her two children to be slaves to pay this debt. And in verse 2 it says, And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, bar not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more and the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children on the rest. And so this is a miraculous story, but God has been speaking to me supernaturally through this. And so I wanna just go back and share what he's spoken to me, but then also make an application because I believe that this isn't limited to me. This will work for any single person in here. And so first of all, this woman, her, her husband had a relationship with Elisha and when he died, she was in financial trouble and she came to Elisha asking for help. And did you know what a lot of people would have done is just pull out their wallet and give her the money that she needed. And this is basically the mindset of our world today. I think this goes back to what Paul was talking about this afternoon, that, you know, we just have this pie and everybody needs to get their peace and they're thinking, you need to help me. But if Elisha would have paid her debt, that would have been the wrong thing to do. And I know there's a lot of people that think, oh, no, we're supposed to have put pity on the poor and we just need to throw money at it. You know, we could go back, and I could spend a lot of time on this, but I remember when Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty and the Great Society, and we started a welfare program and throwing money at the poor. And did you know I heard a statistic not uh, too long ago, just a couple of months ago, that the percentage of poor people in America now is nearly double what it was in the 1960s or 70s when... Johnson declared war on poverty. That is not the way to solve the problem is to just give people a fish, but what we need to do is teach them how to fish. That's a phrase that we use a lot. But our society as a whole, this is what, when they're in trouble, they just come with their hand out. And sad to say, many Christians in an effort to show compassion just give money to people but that's not what they need. This again goes back to what I was talking about in Uganda. Instead of coming in and just setting up feeding programs and wells, we preach the gospel to them. 
But now the people who've received the gospel and have some maturity and some commitment to the Lord, we're teaching them how to prosper and we're teaching them these aquaponics uh, projects and drilling wells and doing things like that to help them. Uh, Paul, we spent a lot of time today sharing about how he went over to Kenya and saw a church that was just struggling. They men under a tin shed. Now they have built, what is the size of their auditorium? And 6,500, and they have completely changed the culture in their area of Kenya, and they have built it with Kenyan money because he taught them how to go out and how to prosper. And this one lady he was given an example of now has 20-something employees working for her, and the, her uh, stuff that she sews is being uh, marketed in Europe and things like that, and they're prospering. This is the way we're supposed to do things, but see... Many people just feel, well, I've, I've got to have compassion on the poor. One of the worst things you can do is just give people money. Thank you for a couple of head nods. I imagine, you know, that there's people sitting right here and saying, well, we're supposed to show compassion. Sometimes the worst thing you can do is be a person's source. You know, I had a man come up to me just two weeks ago or three weeks ago when we started school, and he came up and he says, I'm here and my wife, she wants to come to school too. But we only had enough money for me to come and she's sitting right here and she needs 300 and something dollars to be able to, to get in here and do all of this. And I'm just asking you would, you, would you give us that money? And you know what? I had 300 and something dollars in my pocket and I don't mind. I gave away over $1,000 this last week to one of our students, but they didn't ask for it. If a person comes and asks me for money, I'm not going to give it to them. And anyway, I prayed with him and I encouraged him and told him what to do. But you know, I am just convinced that that is not the way to meet people's needs. We had a man come to our Bible school who works at the Springs Rescue Mission, which our ministry started the Springs Rescue Mission, and it is now the largest distributor of food. It's given away over a million and a half meals in the last few years. It distributes more clothes and more furniture than all of the government agencies in Colorado Springs put together, and that came out of our Bible school, and we do things like this, and we help people. But did you know what? Uh, the guy from the Springs Rescue Mission came to school and we were saying something along these lines and he says that they deal with the homeless all of the time. And he said that the average homeless person standing on the street corner asking for money makes over $300 a day begging. And he says most of them live in nice houses, drive nice cars, but they will dress poor and stand on the street corner and do this because they make more money than they do going and getting a job. And he says if it wasn't for Christians who gave money to them all the time, these people would have to go get a job. He says the worst thing that's happened to the homeless in Colorado Springs is the Christians who go and give them tents and sleeping bags and enable that lifestyle. Amen. Man, I could spend all night on this. But did you know the church was supposed to be administering uh, mercy and help, not the government. The government just throws money at it and gives a program and does stuff like this. And it's not helping the people. In the Bible, it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, I believe it is, if you don't work, don't eat. Did you know if the church was administering things godly, like even in 1 Timothy chapter 5, when you give help to the widows, it says if they have children or relatives that can take care of them, the church should not be helping the widows. And yet there's many scriptures, like in James chapter 1, that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And uh, there's many scriptures that talk about helping them, but then it also says that if they have family that can help them, the church should not take that responsibility. So there are uh, right ways to dispense this. So anyway, my point is that, see, there's a lot of people that would take issue with Elisha. And when she came to him, I believe he, you know, we don't have the benefit of knowing the inflection of his voice, but he didn't say, what can I do to help you? It was like, what can I do to help you? I'm not your source. And instead of him becoming her source, he says, what do you have? 
And this goes back to what I was sharing last night. Paul made mention of it again today. But before you ever have the need, God has anticipated your needs and he has made the supply before your need existed. And this is for every one of us in here. Whatever God's purpose for your life is, there is already supernatural provision. But you have to be able to see it. And the sad thing is, a carnal person, a person that is just looking at things in the natural, will look at what they don't have. This is what so many people do. You know, when we moved into this building, I won't tell you who this was, but one of my staff members, with the day that we moved into this building and we had the dedication and stuff, and we had paid $32 million in a little over three years to get this done, and it was done debt-free. And we, I was already talking about this second building. Instead of seeing what God had already done, and we had no money when we started this thing, instead of seeing that, they started saying, we'll never get this second building done. That second building's twice as much as this. It'll, and they immediately, instead of seeing what God had done, they looked at what we didn't have and said, we can never do that. We've tapped ourselves out. See, I just look at the opposite. I look at it and think, man, look what God has done. There is no way he would start this and pay half of it and then let us fail. But human nature is always going to look at the glass half empty. You see, this is what the disciples did when it came time to feed the multitude. Jesus said, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. Immediately, they pulled out their wallet and looked at what they didn't have up against what the need was, and they cursed what they had. They said, all we've got is five loaves and two fish. This will never feed the multitude. There was 5,000 men, and it says there was also women and children, so a minimum of 10,000, maybe 15,000 people. And they said, five loaves and two fish can't do it. You know what that was? That was cursing what they had. Jesus said, bring it to me. And instead of cursing it, he blessed it. And that little bit that he had multiplied, fed the entire multitude, and they had more left over when they got through than they started with. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we need to see what do we have. And instead of cursing it, I am telling you that God has not called a single person to do anything that there isn't already provision and a way to see that provision come to pass. You do not have to pray and say, oh God, you called me to do this. You called me to build a Bible college campus and now God, I need all of this money. You got to do something. See, you're starting from unbelief. You aren't believing that he's done it. You believe that God is going to respond to you and to your need. I'm telling you, God anticipated what your needs are. Whatever it is that he's called you to do, God has already made the provision and there is something in your hand that will release this provision. There's not a person in here that's excluded from this. I don't care what your color is, what your gender is, what your education level is. It doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. This economy is not your source. God has given something to every single person in here that you can bring to God and God will supernaturally multiply that and every single need that you have will be supplied. And this, I believe, is what Elisha was doing. He says, what do you have? You came looking to me as your source. I am not your source. You know, the best thing that I can do is to teach people how to prosper. And Jamie and I have reached a place in our ministry now that, we, you know, we can give and help a few people along the way, but I can't meet all of the needs out of my resources. But what I can do is teach you what God has taught me and teach you how to believe God. And th that's limitless. If Elisha would have met her need, if he would have had the money, and if he would have paid her debt so that her children would not have gone into slavery, well, what would have happened next week when they didn't have anything to eat? Would she have to come back and he start paying for that? Or what would happen the next time she had a need? You know, he couldn't live with her. He couldn't be her source. And so it was wisdom for him to point her back to God. He had been teaching her husband. He was one of the sons of the prophet. They had heard a lot of these things, but instead of using what they had, which was faith in God. And did you know Elisha had already multiplied food? 
He had already done this. He had already performed many miracles. Elisha performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. This man had been taught faith, and I guarantee you his wife had heard it, but instead she was looking to him for help, and he referred her back to the Lord, pointed her to the Lord, which is what we are supposed to be doing. We should not make people dependent upon the government or upon us. We should make all of our help towards them, teaching them how to prosper, teaching them how to get out and fish instead of just give them a fish. Amen. And so he told her to go borrow all of these pots. And you know, the, the meaning was obvious. There was no reason to borrow pots unless she understood God was going to multiply this little bit of oil. He says, what do you have? And she says, I don't have anything but a little bit of oil. But she had something. You know, there are people right here that are saying, well, I just don't have much. You have something. Every one of you have something. You have talents. You have abilities. You have faith. You have money. Some people say, no, I don't have any money. Yes, you do. You can't live without money. Did you know people that are on poverty level, according to the U.S. standards, are wealthier than 90% of the world's population? I guarantee you there's people sitting right here, and I'm not criticizing your lifestyle. I'm just trying to help you see that you do have money. But there are some of you who spend $4 a day on a Starbucks. Did you know that's $120 a month? What would happen if you were to take just a portion of that? What would happen if you took $20 a month and started sewing it? and investing and setting it aside and doing things. What would happen if we didn't go in debt and pay two and three times what it costs for a house and for a car and instead just started paying cash for things? I guarantee you, we've got money and we could do something with it, but, but most of us are cursing while we have it. God, it's not enough, and oh God, what I have is not enough. You have whatever it is that you need to prosper. If God has given you uh, purpose. If he has shown you his will for your life, you have what it takes to accomplish that. You may not see it, but you do have it. You know, this is what I did. I called my executive team together. I forget when this was, but it was in the spring, I think. And I shared what God was sh showing me. You know, I was praying about all of this and I was saying, God, we need something. And he, he just reminded me that before you ever had the need, I created the supply. And so I got to saying, where is it? And that's when God led me to this and showed me that this woman had something. The fact was she just wasn't using and wasn't mixing faith with what she had. So I called my executive team together and I said, look, we've got everything that we need to accomplish God's instructions. And so I shared this with them and I said, I want you to pray about this. And then next week when we meet, I want you to come with at least two or three things in every department that we have that we aren't utilizing. And we came back, and I, you could ask Paul, Karen, others that were here, and I mean, it was amazing, the ideas. We've already implemented one or two of them, and we've got other things working. Uh, Paul was talking about some of this. We've got things that, we've got these resources, like the people from MIT and Deloitte Touche, or however you say that, and we've got, we've got resources that God has sent us that are phenomenal. And we haven't been leveraging them. We haven't been using them. And we've got things in the work that have the potential of producing millions and millions of dollars. We had an idea tonight that I'm premature, but we were thinking about partners maybe helping us invest and build these lodges and use it as an investment and set it up as a corporation so that you actually make money off of your investment. And we're going to start doing things like this. And there's just so, I guarantee you, we have, we are rich. We are rich. I don't have the money in hand, but God has given us whatever it takes, and we are in the process. Matter of fact, I told them, I think it was just last week, that you know what, we've started a number of ideas in, in uh, motion, and I said, next week when we meet, I want you to come back with some more ideas of what do we have that we aren't utilizing. Every one of us need to be doing this. Brothers and sisters, God is not caught by surprise by the U.S. economy by what's going on in your life, the Lord has anticipated any situation that could possibly come. And if he said come, 
you can get out of the boat and you can start doing it. I don't care what the situation looks like. Every person in here has something that you can utilize, but we are intimidated, we limit God, and we just aren't looking at it. But every one of you have something. You are anointed by God. If nothing else, what Jesse was sharing today really touched me about that the blessing that was on uh, Peter when he called to his partners and man, they got the same blessing that was on him. I can guarantee you God has blessed this ministry. It is phenomenal what God is doing in this ministry. It is not man. Some of you have heard me tell this story, but right before my mother died, she was asking about what's God doing and I was telling her about things worldwide and she was blessed, but she said, Andy, you know this is God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know this is God. And then she stuck her little bony finger right in my face, and she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. Man, it's like that song we sang tonight. Every praise is to our God. I don't take credit for anything. I was showing the mayor around our building and he says, you must be so proud. And I said, pride's not the right word. That would imply I did this. I said, I'm not doing this. I'm just like in a roller coaster. I'm holding on for dear life. I'm not in control of this thing. I'm just doing what God's asked me. And God's sending me Paul and all of these people. And, and it's just a God thing. God is doing it. So if nothing else, I can guarantee you the blessing and the anointing of God is on this ministry and you have partnered with us and this same anointing and blessing is upon you. But you've got to start seeing it by faith and you've got to start speaking a blessing over what you've got instead of cursing it and talking about how it's not enough. You need to start believing. And anyway, I could go, there's a lot of things in here, but let me mix with this what the Lord told me, January the 31st, 2002, the second most important encounter that I ever had with the Lord in my life. The first would be March the 23rd, 1968, but on January the 31st, 2002, it was, a, uh, it was the, uh, what do you call it, the climax of something that he had been speaking to me for two or three months, and it finally got across to me, Psalms chapter 78, verse 41. Let me just turn over and read that to you. This is, I, I'm not sure I'd quote it right. I can quote the port, portion of it that God used to change my life. But in Psalm 78, verse 41, it was talking about the Jews who came out of Egypt, and it says in verse 41, yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And God, I mean, just burned it into my heart that you're limiting me. You're limiting me by your small thinking. And I hadn't got the words to tell you what that did to me, but I stayed up nearly all night long. I got up the next morning. I, we were at a minister's conference, and I told the people, I said, this is the second most important thing, I said, my whole life is transforming because I had limited God by my small thinking. I called my staff together on February the 11th and I told, at that time we had 20 something staff in 2002. Now we have over 500. And I called my staff together and I said, I don't know how long it takes to change the image on the inside. If it's a week, a month, a year, but I said, I'm going to change. I'm going to take the limits off God. I'm going to start believing big. And see, I knew that God called me to have a worldwide impact. I've known that since day one. I don't know how I knew it. I just knew it. It was in my heart. It was what I wanted. It was my dream. And I've been moving in that direction. But that happened in 1968. And until 2002, it wasn't time yet. And so every time I tried to tell people what my vision was, they just criticized me. And there was no evidence of it in my life whatsoever. People were staying away from my meetings by the multiple thousands. <laughs> and so after, you know, if you reach down to pet a dog and if every time you do it bites you, you'll eventually quit petting that dog. And if every time you try and speak forth your faith and people just look at you and think like you are absolutely crazy. There is no evidence of it. After a while, you quit speaking your vision. So I had quit speaking my vision. It wasn't time. And I was just occupying where I was and doing what God told me to do. And in January of 2000, we started on television and our ministry doubled from 
2000, January of 2000 to January of 2002. It had doubled. And I, I thought that was pretty good. Matter of fact, I had a man come to me and prophesy to me in January of 2002. And he says, God is about ready to multiply your ministry. And I, I didn't say anything to him, but I thought to myself, you're two years too late. I said, it's already happening. Man, we're already busting at the seams. But God spoke to me and he says, you're limiting me by your small thinking. And I hadn't allowed myself to see myself impacting the world. I knew that that was God's will for my life, but I couldn't see it. And I could spend hours teaching on imagination. Hopefully some of you have heard me teach on that. But you can't see anything on the outside that you haven't already seen on the inside. I had information, I knew what God's will for my life was, but I couldn't see it coming to pass for multiple reasons. One of them is because I was just in a holding powder. I was still going through the school of hard knocks. It hadn't been time up until this time, and so it wasn't time for me to be seeing those things happen. Part of it was I was actually afraid of God increasing my influence and, and having me minister to more people because I'd seen people's lives destroyed, lifted up with pride and get into things. And man, my relationship with the Lord was more important to me than any ministry or anything. And man, I was, I was enjoying my anonymity and I was enjoying just ministering and seeing some people's lives change, but I didn't have to deal with things like people coming after me and suing me. Nobody knew who I was. And so I was enjoying that. Plus for the first time in our life, we were eating on a regular basis. And it looked like, you know, there was light at the end of the tunnel and it wasn't another train. It looked like we were going to live and not die. And I was just lazy. Did you know it, it takes effort for you to stretch yourself and to lean out and to begin to start thinking big and believing God. And a lot of people just take the easy way out. And so there was multiple reasons. But anyway, for a multitude of reasons, I wasn't allowing myself to think big and to see things. And I wasn't pressing and I wasn't, I wasn't dreaming the way that I should. And brothers and sisters, this is a major problem. And I'm sharing this with you as my partners because we really believe that God wants to prosper you. We believe that you are called to prosper, that this is part of God's purpose for your life. And I know that there's people right here that have an anointing on your life and yet for some of the same reasons. Maybe you're just comfortable. You know, I have people when I teach on prosperity, they'll come up and they say, I don't like this prosperity stuff. I don't have a lot, but I've got enough. You know, we're taken care of. Everything's okay. And I'm just not going to believe God for all of this prosperity. That's because they think prosperity is selfish. And that you are believing God for money so that you can just have bigger houses, bigger cars. And they take scriptures that talk about that the love of money is the root of all evil. And that you should be content with what you have. And they think that that excludes prosperity. They say, I've got enough. And so I'm just not believing God for any more. You know what? I've gotten to where I respond to people and I said, that is selfish. <laughs> they think that believing for prosperity is selfish. Well, it could be if you are believing for prosperity just so you can have a bigger house, bigger car, and more stuff. But if you are believing for prosperity so that you can be a blessing and so that you can fulfill the purpose of God, if it's not going to be just all consumed upon yourself, that is the proper attitude. The person who said, I've got enough and I don't need any more, so therefore I'm not believing for any more. You're the selfish person. You think money is for you. And so when you get yours, forget the rest of the world. Forget preaching the gospel. Forget doing anything else. I got enough, and so I'm not asking God for any more. That is super selfish. That's greedy. Yes. I'm believing for a lot of money, but you know what? It's not for Jamie and me. Jamie and I are blessed. Our ministry takes care of us. But you know, I drive a Ford Escape. If I had a Rolls Royce, I couldn't get it up my hill. <laughs> I got a gr gravel driveway that's like 25% grade. Even in the summer, you have to have a four-wheel drive to get up my car. I couldn't drive it up there. 
We live in a house that I built for $60,000. And it was worth more than that. The builder gave me a good deal. I probably got it for half price. It might have been $120,000. And since then, we've added some to it. But I live, most of you live in a nicer house than I do. I love where I live. I'm not disliking it. I could go buy anything I want right now. But you know what? I live in a house that was $60,000 to build. And I just love where I live. I'm not taking money. I'm not believing for money so that I can have all of this stuff for myself. I'm pumping it into the gospel. Jamie and I have given away over 80 and 90% of our year income some years. It's not that way all the time, but sometimes we do. It just depends how God leads us. I'm not using our money for myself. And I believe that that's the right attitude of prosperity. If God can get the money through you, he will get it to you. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, or excuse me, chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Now he that giveth seed to the sower and bread to the eater, both multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. God gives seed to sowers. And he's talking here about money. He's using money like a seed because that really is a great way to describe it because when you sow, see we call this a sower seminar. When you sow, not just give, but when you sow, that money doesn't leave your life. It just enters into your future where it grows and it multiplies and it comes back to you. And so God gives seed money to people who will give and let it pass through them. But people who are sowers also need to eat. God will never give you only something to sow, but he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He will give you some for yourself. And I guarantee you, God is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. He will take care of you better than you would take care of yourself. And God will bless you, but your focus isn't on, oh God, I want more for me. This is a hard attitude. You can't just tell by looking at a person. But God looks on the heart. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, it says, If I give all of my goods to feed the poor, or if I give my body to be burned and don't do it by charity, God's kind of love, it profits me nothing. God looks at your heart, not just at your action. It doesn't matter how much you give. If you have a wrong heart in your giving, you void the return, the harvest, it kills it. It profits you nothing. That's the reason that like Paul was saying today, many people have given and given and given. And if you had a hundredfold return on everything you've given, you would be filthy, stinking, dirty, rich. But you don't always see the return because the heart attitude is wrong. If you're giving out a debt, I've got to pay this debt so God won't curse me, you killed your harvest. If you give out of, uh, you know, worrying about what other people are going to think, they're taking up an offering and you really don't want to give anything, but you don't want to be perceived as a cheap person, so you'll put something in. You just lost that money. But when you give with the right attitude, that money never leaves your life. It just enters into your future where it grows and multiplies. And if you really live to give, this is a hard attitude. And if you get to where God... Like it says in Ephesians 4, 28, it says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good. And here's the reason you labor, that you might have to give to him that needs. The reason you work isn't to pay your bills. It's not to pay your rent. It's not to buy food. The reason you work is so that you can have to give. And I know somebody's thinking, if I had that attitude, I'd starve. That would be true if there wasn't a God who said that when you seek first the kingdom of God, then all of these other things, what you eat, where you sleep, what you're clothed with, will be added unto you. Do you know this goes right over the head of most people? There's even people here, partners here, people, I love you, but there are people here that you won't get this because this has to be caught by the Spirit. It has to come by revelation. You cannot figure this out with your natural mind. But if you work and if the burden is on you, if you are the source of your prosperity, then it's gonna, the responsibility is always going to be on you. 
But you can get to a place to where, God, you're my source. And the reason I'm working this job is because you put me here. I have an opportunity to use my resources to honor you. I'm going to be a blessing to people. And you don't do it for the money. You don't do it to get a paycheck. You do it because this is God's will for you. And if you put God first like that, and the first thing you did when you make out a budget isn't to fit, sit down and figure out what your expenses are and then write down the tithe down here at the end. But the very first thing you do is say, man, I gave 5,000, 10,000 last year. This next year, I want to double it. And if you wrote down your giving, if you live to give, God would become your source, not that job. And God would get money to you through sources totally outside of that job. He would use your job, but it's not limited to that job. You are limiting God when you see that job as your source. You're limiting God. And just like the Lord told me, you need to take the limits off. You need to quit looking for your job and only waiting on a cost of living increase and only waiting on a promotion God can prosper you. God can give you creative ideas. Did you know we just had a, uh, I think it was our Healing is Here conference that this lady who used to be in our ministry out in Lamar, Colorado, when Jamie and I were holding Bible studies there, this woman, her husband, worked at the Dairy Queen. And he didn't make a lot of money working at the Dairy Queen. And she was a stay-at-home mom, had, what, four or five kids or something like that. She's stronger than horseradish. Saw her daughter raised from the dead. Saw her mother raised from the dead while we were there. This lady was a strong believer, but they were struggling financially. And we started sharing these things about believing God. And this woman started believing God for creative ideas. And one day she was making clay, cooking it on the stove because she didn't like the clay that she bought in the stores because it was toxic, it would stick to the carpet, it would make a mess. So she came up with her own recipe that was non-toxic. The kids could eat it if they wanted to. It wouldn't stick to anything except the clay. And so she fixed her own clay for her kids. And while she was cooking this clay on the stove, she was praying and saying, God, I believe that we have something that you can bless. Give me an idea. Speak to me. Show me something. And while she was cooking this clay, the Lord said, take those clay, put it into six little rolls, color them differently, put them in a Ziploc bag, and start going to these fairs and selling them. And within a short period of time, she had up to 89 women working for her and became a millionaire selling clay. And did you know she's been doing that for years, but she didn't quit. There's always something else. Just like I was telling my staff, hey, we need to reevaluate. What else do we have in our hand? She just came to this healing is here and she came back here and visited with us and she was on Shark Tank. I've never seen that show, but she was telling me about it. And she was on Shark Tank and she had the biggest response of any person who has ever been on there. She developed this little board that you stand on that's got a bubble on the bottom and you twist. If any of you saw that, she was that lady. And I forget the exact stats, but within five hours of being on Shark Tank, all of their phone center was overwhelmed, their computers crashed, and they made, I forgot how much it was, but multiple millions of dollars in five hours. And now she's got another thing that's going to be, she's already taped it, and it's going to be on Shark Tank sometime soon. And she said that her agent that's handling the thing said that her first check uh, royalty could be a billion dollar check. And this is a woman that just a few years back could barely feed her family. Jamie and I would give her money and help her and stuff. And she had ideas. God doesn't love her more than she loves any of us. Every one of you have the ability to do this. You got something. Instead of just, oh God, please give me money. Oh God, please do something. What is it that God gave you? You've got a talent. You've got an ability. You've got an idea. You've got something. Every one of you. God never made a dud. God has never made a failure. Every one of you can prosper and far beyond what just your job can give you. God could give you a creative idea. Man, we are just 
We are limiting God by our small thinking. And I can tell you since 2002, that's now been 14 years. At that time we had 20 something employees. Now we have 500 employees. I don't even know what our income was, but it would have been two million or less in a year. Now we've had up to what? Five and a half or six million in one month, some months. It is phenomenal what happened. And you know what? It was because I changed the way I was thinking. And when the Lord showed this to me, it took us two and a half months for me to write a letter, figure out how to communicate this to people, what to say, two and a half months to write it, to produce it, to mail it out, and for it to come to our partners. Were any of you partners back then and heard that? Some of you got that letter? Just a few of you. But anyway, it took two and a half months. But did you know before there was any physical uh, telling of what had happened and telling my partners and encouraging them to respond, our income doubled per month before I told a soul. There was something that happened in the spiritual realm long before there was stuff that happened in the physical realm. See, there's a balance here. Some people are always looking for, how did you do this? What did you do? What did you say in this letter? Well, God used the letter and my partners responded and things happened, but I saw an increase before the letter ever went out. There was something that happened in the spiritual realm. God can use your job. I'm not telling you to quit a job, but I'm saying you need to look beyond that. There's something in the spiritual realm. And many of us are limiting God by our small thinking. We aren't believing for increase beyond just your job, just the cost of living or whatever. You're believing that because the economy's you know, down and because we've been dealing in a recession that therefore you can't prosper. That limits God. I'm telling you, there is no limit upon God. God is not limited by the U.S. economy. We are the ones that limit God. And you as our partners, I'm telling you, God has been speaking this to me. What do I have? God has given us so much. We are beginning to start reevaluating and we are coming up with ideas that's not only going to draw money, but it's going to produce money. And every one of you, God is saying the same thing to you, that there are things you can do to change your business, to change things that are going on and to prosper. Isn't that awesome? Every one of you have this, but you need to, first of all, with me, I had to come to this conclusion that God, it's not you that's not supplying. It's me that's limiting what you can do. And the Lord showed me, I had Susan Porter come up last night and George, another guy, I don't know his last name, come up last night and both of them back to back confirmed all of this. The Lord showed me it was just like there was a dam behind me like a Hoover Dam, a huge dam. And God had been sending the supply the whole time for what he told me to do. But my small thinking was limiting him and just holding this back. And that when I made this change in my heart and started changing, something happened in the spiritual that broke this dam and a supernatural supply started flowing towards me. And it was supernatural. It was supernatural. It wasn't just me going and telling my partners before I even told them I saw the supply. And I'm saying it's the same for you. Whatever God has called you to do, did you know God is faithful to send the supply whether you get it or not? If you've never heard my teaching on a place called there from the series on Elijah, you ought to get it. Before you leave tonight, you ought to get it. I've got a sign down here when you first come in. It says, welcome to your place called there. And this is taken from 2 Kings chapter 7. That He told Elisha, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. But if Elisha would have stayed where he was and not gone where God told him to go, did you know God said, I've already commanded the ravens. They were already on their way. And ravens could fly faster than he could walk or run. So that meant that the supply was on, in the pipeline before Elisha even, Elijah even got there and received it. And if Elijah would have stayed where he was, did you know that God still would have been sending the provision? There would have been a whole bunch of flesh and bread piled up by the brook Cherith 
But from Elisha, Elijah's perspective, he would have said, God, let me starve. No, God didn't let him starve. God sent the supply. It just, you have to go there. And the reason a lot of people don't see God's provision is because you aren't all there. <laughs> you got to go there. What did God tell you to do? Your provision is there doing what God told you to do. He doesn't send the provision to you. It's like we throw a football, not where the receiver is, but where he's going. You, you lead him with it. God has sent your provision. There is supernatural, miraculous financial provision for every person in here, but God is sending it to where he told you to be and what he told you to do. And if you are waiting and saying, oh God, you just give me the provision and then I'll go do it. It's not going to be that way. God doesn't send the provision to you right where you are. He sends your provision to where he told you to go. So you need to find out your purpose. You need to take the limits off God. You need to say, God, I have something in my hand that I can use to accomplish your will for my life. And if you will go to believing and stepping out, man, there is no limit to the prosperity that God could give you. And again, it's not just for you. Now, as you know, one hand to receive and one hand to give, and as the money flows through, there's always plenty for you. It'll just stick to you. You can't outgive God. So I'm not saying that you live a Spartan life and don't have anything, but I'm saying your goal isn't, it's not about you. It's about fulfilling God's purpose for your life. And when you get to where you live to give, if God can get it through you, he will get it to you. Amen. Man, isn't that good news? Thank you, Jesus. I know there's probably somebody in here thinking, oh man, I'm just... You're shooting down all of my dreams of me having all of these houses and yachts and a second and third home and all of this. And you're just telling me to put the money into the gospel. First of all, if you put first the kingdom of God, God will give things to you. You don't have to do without. But I can promise you this. When we get to heaven, there won't be a one of you that comes up and says, I wish you hadn't have encouraged me to give so much. I wish I'd have had a bigger house, a bigger car. When you get to heaven, you aren't going to care whether you had five flat screen TVs or not. The only thing that's going to last is people and what we do for the kingdom. And God has given us wealth, Deuteronomy 8, 18, so that he can establish his covenant here in the earth. That's the reason that God has prospered us. He has blessed us to make us a blessing. Genesis chapter 12, that's what he told Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. You can't be the blessing that God wants you to be if you aren't blessed. You can't give to other people if you don't have it to give. So God wants to bless you. But the reason that he blesses us is not for us, it's for other people. But as you put first the kingdom of God... God is just going to see to it that he'll take care of you. Isn't that awesome? Like Jesse was saying today, he went out and bought his daughter a car, just whatever she wants. And then as soon as he had done that, God says, all right, Jesse, what do you want? And I'll buy you a plane. I'll give you this. You can't out give God. You ought to try it. You can't do it. Man, thank you, Jesus. What a blessing. I'm telling you, I'm just so excited. I've really, really, really benefited. I feel like that uh, I've made a new connection with you. I hope that you feel like you've connected with this ministry. And we are partners and praise God. We are prospering. We are believing that God is prospering you. And we believe that together we are going to give the devil a headache. Amen. Amen. We're going to punish the devil. Thank you, Father. So, Father, we thank you for all of these truths. Thank you for these things. And, Father, thank you that the things that you've done in my life and in Jamie's life and the way that we've seen your blessing and your prosperity, Father, thank you that what you've done for me that you will do for any person in here. Father, I just agree with the prayer that Paul prayed today and Jesse prayed. Father, we believe that your blessing is upon every one of our partners. 
Father, we believe the blessing that you have commanded upon me and all of the things that you've given me to do that's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars. Father, thank you that the anointing that it takes to accomplish that is not just on me and on my staff, but Father, it's on our partners. Thank you that these partners share in this vision. That Father, we are partners. Partners catch more fish. That Father, together, I thank you that this anointing is flowing through them. And I believe that Father, you are taking people who may have been discouraged, may have been thinking small and that they've been encouraged this weekend and that Father they are going to start believing that they have something in their house that given to you you can multiply it Father thank you for creative ideas Father thank you for those who've been cursing themselves and cursing their business and cursing their job and speaking about how it's insufficient and it's not meeting the need I thank you that they will quit doing that and instead they'll turn around and bless it they will start blessing their business their employer Father, they will start blessing themselves that they will speak about being prosperous and able to give and to do everything that you have called them to do. Father, I just believe that the Holy Spirit has supernaturally quickened people's hearts, that their faith has been quickened. And Father, we're going to leave this place encouraged that we will leave this place in a new level of faith, that we will take the limits off of God that we will prosper personally and then we will prosper fulfilling the purpose that you've called us to. Father, we agree. And I thank you. I thank you that the kingdom of God is going to be affected because of the things that have happened last night and today. Thank you, Father. And Father, for every person that gave in the offering here, I believe for a hundredfold return in this life, supernaturally, quickly, miraculous supply. Thank you that businesses are going to prosper like never before. I hear the Lord saying, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, because you're going to break forth on the right hand and on the left. Man, there is increase coming. And just as this woman, when she ran out of pots and they said there's not another one, the oil stayed. God will not give you increase that you aren't prepared for. You've got to prepare for increase. You've got to make room for increase and he will only increase you to the degree that you're ready. He is not going to pour his oil, his prosperity out on the ground. So man, get ready. Think big. Believe God. Man, make provision for huge increase. Father, we agree and we receive this and we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. <laughs>